it became my definition of minimalism. It, minimalism is the intentional promotion of the things we most value by removing anything that distracts us from it, um, which is a very purpose-based uh, approach to the lifestyle. It's our limiting beliefs that ultimately keep us from becoming the best we're capable of becoming. Something's gotta change, but that change has to happen first on the inside. It's time to get unstuck. It's time to get your why back. It's never too late. Let's start today. Helping you design your roadmap to wholeness from the inside out. This is Win Today. And now, here's your host, Christopher Cook. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. As always, thank you for the download. This is episode 147 of Win Today, and this is your roadmap to wholeness from the inside out. You know, I really believe that part of your journey to wholeness not only includes decluttering your soul, but also decluttering your home. Why? Because I personally believe that a super abundance of stuff and clutter distracts us from focusing on what matters most in life. And so in today's conversation, one of the most influential minimalist advocates takes us on a decluttering tour of our own homes, showing us how to decide what to get rid of and what to keep. Meet Joshua Becker. Joshua Becker wasn't always a minimalist, but one day while cleaning out the garage, Joshua's five-year-old son made a single statement that set off the momentum to make a permanent change. He said, maybe you don't need to own all this stuff, dad. And so Joshua immediately recognized something needed to change. His belongings were not adding value to his life, but instead they were subtracting from it. And so began their journey of donating, recycling, and removing their unnecessary personal possessions. In fact, they embarked on an intentional journey to own less stuff. And as a result, they discovered more money, more time, more energy, more freedom, less stress, and more opportunity to pursue their greatest passions, their faith, their family, and their friends. And so in today's conversation, Joshua offers practical guidelines for simplifying your lifestyle at home and addresses underlying issues that contribute to overaccumulation in the first place. You know, the purpose of this exercise is not just to create a more inviting living space. It's also to turn your home into a launching pad for a more fulfilling and productive life in the world. And I believe that is a key component of designing your roadmap to wholeness from the inside out. So right now, let's get to my conversation with Joshua Becker. Joshua, I'm so glad you could join the conversation today. Welcome. Uh, it is my pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm so glad. We're going we're gonna to dive in and have quite a practical conversation today. As we had shared, not really a conversation I've ever had here on Win today, but I really think there's a, a point below the practicality of what we're going to talk about that's going to really be a value add for our friends listening today. So I'd love to start here and ask, what's the passion point for you behind becoming a minimalist? I'd love to hear the backstory. Uh, the drive for me is when I realized how my possessions were keeping me from the life that I wish I was living instead. Uh, in, a, in a very practical way, it was a Saturday morning cleaning out my garage while my five-year-old son played alone in the backyard. Um, he was constantly, every 20 or 30 minutes, asking me to come play catch, and I just kept pushing him off. I got to finish the garage, you know, give me one more minute, one more minute, one more minute, which turned into hours, um, as some of these projects tend to do. I, uh, I struck up a conversation with my neighbor. Um, I was complaining a little bit about how much time had gone into my project. And she said, you know, that's why my daughter is a minimalist. She keeps telling me I don't need to own so much stuff. And I remember looking at the pile of dirty, dusty things in my driveway that I'd spent all morning taking care of, knowing full well that my possessions weren't making me happy, or at least I would have said that I wasn't looking for happiness in possessions. But out of the corner of my eye, I noticed my five-year-old son swinging alone on the swing set in the backyard and suddenly realized that not only were my possessions not making me happy, even worse, 
My possessions were actually taking me away from the very thing that did bring me happiness in life and purpose and joy and fulfillment. So that was the that was the moment. Um, I think that's the moment for most people who decide to make this decision where they just realize um, that their possessions are actually distracting them and keeping them from the life that they wish that they were living instead. So fast forward, and then you have this huge platform called Becoming a Minimalist. From that moment in the garage till that point, what was the setup? What, what's your background? Well, from there, um, we just began uh, moving our way through the home, uh, room by room, getting rid of anything and everything that we didn't need. Uh, I usually say it took about three months for us to get through most of the lived-in areas. Uh, it took about nine months, if you want to count, basements and storage sheds and garages um, and that sort of stuff. Uh, got rid of about 60-70% of our possessions. Uh, along the way, I started a, a blog, um, started becoming minimalist.com. That was the decision that we had made was to become minimalist. Um, mostly as a place just to journal what we are doing, what we are getting rid of, what we are keeping, what we are learning um, through the process. And um, yeah, I think more and more people were drawn to the story and more and more people were drawn uh, to the lifestyle. And so eventually it became uh, a blog where I thought to myself, you know, maybe I don't need to blog about which belt I'm getting rid of today. You know, can I use this to... Um, serve my neighbor's role in other people's lives. And so how can we inspire other people to find the the benefits of owning less? And mm. so it's grown into what it is today, one, one million visitors every month. Oh my gosh. Well, talk about that for a minute. Is it an organization? Is it just a social platform? I'm not honestly too familiar with it. What, what do you guys do? Sure. Um, well, it's, uh, it is primarily um, a blog uh, primarily becoming minimalist.com is a blog. I, I write uh, two or three times a week. Um, have a few guest writers from um, here and there. Um, it uh, it eventually became a couple books: uh, the More of Less, which came out two and a half years ago, and the Minimalist Home, which just came out in December. Um, I started seeing that there were a lot of people who wanted to embrace this lifestyle, but books weren't enough and uh, videos weren't enough and they wanted a community and practical help. And so uh, we created a, a 12 week course called Uncluttered, uh, mm. which 25,000 people have, have gone through and used to, um, to minimize their homes. Um, started a, a couple digital magazines uh, with some friends of mine. Just, um, you know, I started to know some other writers in the space and like, what if we got together and created, you know, created something? So um, a couple digital magazines as well. Started a nonprofit organization um, several years ago. So uh, a number of different things that kind of sprouted out from this decision to own less stuff. Mm. Uh, Joshua, I, what I hear behind what you're saying is, is a values-driven motivation in there. I'd love for you to unpack that even more. What's really driving that? Yeah, it's, you know, when I, when I talk about minimalism, um, one of the things that I that I try to explain to people, like right off the bat, is that minimalism looks very different from one person to another, uh, from one living situation to another, from one family to another. Uh, it looks different based on the job that you have. A minimalist writer is going to own something different than a minimalist teacher or a minimalist architect, minimalist account, right? So it it looks very different from one person to another, but the benefits are always the same in that owning less means that we have more money um, because we're buying less and taking care of less. We have more time because we're doing less cleaning and organizing and managing and maintaining. Uh, it means we have less stress um, in our lives. It means we have more focus and more energy. What it means is that we have more opportunity to pursue our passions uh, whatever those passions are, and our passions tend to be wrapped up in our our values, right? Like, um, like what do I want to do with my life? What do I want to accomplish? Um, that Saturday morning for me, it was, man, I don't want to spend the rest of my life taking care of stuff that I don't need. I want to spend my life being a good father and. Um, I was a pastor at the time. I, I want to be a better pastor and I want to um, reach more people and help more people. 
Um, once I started seeing how owning less allowed me to walk more fully in those pursuits and in those passions, um, that was the the draw of minimalism. And it it became my definition of minimalism. It, minimalism is the intentional promotion of the things we most value by removing anything that distracts us from it, um, which is a very purpose-based approach, uh, approach to the lifestyle. I have never heard it said that way, and that's really brilliant. The intentional promotion of the things we value most. Yeah, and it and it looks different from person to person. You know, I mean, some people pursue minimalism because they want to travel more, because they want to get out of debt, because they want to retire early, mm-hmm. you know, because they, they want to, you know, lie on a beach for the rest of their lives. You know, like some people pursue it for, for those reasons. Others because... Yeah, I want to spend more time with my my family. Um, they want to to free up opportunity, time, and money to uh, to pursue God or to be involved in their community. Um, and so it's you know we like I mentioned as a pastor, we had three different small groups meeting in our home uh, over the course of a week. I was doing premarital counseling at the time, and so there were things that I was going to own mm-hmm. because those things were important to me. Um, that maybe, you know, the minimalist down the street wouldn't own because, you know, they were pursuing um, something different with their lives than I was. Mm. Why do you believe minimalism is trending today? I mean, even consider the tiny house movement. Well, I think there's a lot of reasons for it. Um, I think probably the the biggest reason, um, just to to paint paint in broad strokes here, is that that we've reached a a level of peak stuff i think in in the world um you know at least in our you know kind of western developed nations mm-hmm. the the average american home has tripled in size in the last 50 years and still 10 percent of us rent off-site storage the la mm-hmm. times says the average american home has 300,000 items inside of it um, ever since World War II, we've just been like accumulating more and more things and building bigger and bigger castles to put more and more stuff in. And I think at some point there was going to be um, a pushback. At some point, I think we were going to realize that that the promises of happiness that all the advertisers are selling us um, isn't isn't actually panning out the way they promised. And so uh, I think you find some people just reaching this level and um, deciding that their houses are too full and and they want something else. Uh, I think that technology um, makes minimalism far easier today than ever before. Um, uh, I think that each of the generations has reached a point where, you know, the silent generation is um, having to downsize um, for health reasons or financial reasons. The baby boomers are retiring and downsizing because of it. The millennials uh, very concerned about the environment and have never really gotten into the consumeristic um, culture that most people are. And then Gen X, which is where I was, we're like right in the middle, mm-hmm. but we've got kids and we've got baby boomer parents giving us more and more stuff. And I think we've kind of reached this this limit and are looking for a, a new way of living. It, yeah. And we're going to dive in here tactically in just a moment. Joshua, but I'd love to ask before we do, what's the biggest misconception people have about pursuing minimalism at home? Uh, Two misconceptions. Number one, that this is some rigid rule-based thing that they can only own a certain amount of this or a certain amount of that. Um, That's probably the first misconception that can be further from the truth. Um, You know, everyone gets to make their own decisions uh, about what to keep. Um, ultimately, minimalism, the, the goal isn't to own the fewest amount of things as possible. The goal of minimalism is to own just the right amount of things, um, the optimal amount of things, uh, which, which for most people is less than they currently have. The other misconception is that this is somehow uh, a stark, barren, boring life um, that, uh, that it strips all joy out of life. And I've I found it to be just the opposite, um, that as I uh, owned less, I was freed up to pursue those things that do bring me life and do bring me fulfillment. Um, and uh, in my very first you know, newspaper interview I did years and years ago in Albany, New York, they had all these questions about why I became a minimalist and what I learned. And then the last question was, do you think you're ever going to go back? You know, Is this just a phase you're going through? 
And it was like the easiest question of the whole interview. I'm like, no way. Like I'm yeah. never going back to the way life was before. I'm, I'm, uh, I freed up all of my finite resources in my one finite life to pursue things that actually matter. I'm, I'm never going back to the way I was before. Yeah. Well, let's dive in tactically right now, Joshua, because I, I really believe this could be a huge benefit for everyone sitting across the table from us, if you will. Where do we start? I mean, you teach something called the Becker Method. Can we go through the, com- the most common rooms and then break down some steps? Yeah, sure. Um, the uh, the Becker Method is first and foremost purpose-based. Uh, the very first step is is to to get clear on on why you want to minimize, why you want to own less, and you can do it in one sentence. I desire to own less so that I can blank. You know what whatever it is that you are passionate about that you wish you were doing rather than taking care of your things. Um, it it, uh, it it starts there, um, and then the the process is uh, easiest to hardest. You know I think people you know, hear about owning less and they immediately think to their garage or their basement or how am I ever going to get rid of my books or my sentimental items? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I always say, you don't, you don't start there. Like don't start in the garage and don't start in the basement. It's, it's too overwhelming. Start in an easy space that you can complete entirely and then appreciate the benefits of it. Like your living room. If you can remove things from your living room that aren't needed when you sit down in the evening, it just feels more calm and more peaceful and less stressful. And then you'll be motivated. How do I, let's do this in the bedroom and let's do this in the bathroom and the closets. And uh, you get to some of those harder spaces a little bit further down the road after you build up the muscle a little bit. So where do we start? I mean, real practically, how do we approach it from a, from a mindset perspective? Let's say it's the living room. Like you just said, everyone congregates there, or maybe it's the kitchen because like when I was growing up, we all hung around the kitchen, around the big island. If if you were to come into my home, Joshua, and say, well, you wouldn't find it in my home because I cannot stand clutter. <laughs> <laughs> but you go, to, you go to someone else's home and you walk in the door and you were to start, what would that look like step by step? I mean, how, how does the listener take this from theory into practice? Sure. I, uh, I I might start by, before I even walk into the house, I, I might start in the car. Uh, I think the car is a great place because it's usually pretty small and pretty combined. Yeah, yep. uh, you can finish it in 10 or 15 minutes. And then the next time you sit down in your car, you're like, oh, this is great without that little red rubber ball rolling around in the back. <laughs> or, you know, this is great without all this clutter around. It's like I can focus on my day rather than um, you know, this stack of CDs I don't listen to or coins, you know, um, fluttering about in the door. So I would, I would start there. Um, and then I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to the kitchen next. I would go to the living room. Um, in most homes, it's, it's a place that the people can complete. I know every home looks a little bit different. And for some people, like the living room is piled full and full of things, but, uh, but for most people, the, the living room is a place where you spend your time, um, uh, I talk in the book about having a like identifying the purpose of your room. Like, what is the purpose of your living room? What is the purpose of your bedroom? Um, what's your goal? What do you What do you want this this room to foster and grow and promote? And then, what are all the things in the room that are distracting from those from those purposes? Uh, generally speaking, the, uh, the best advice is to, uh, physically handle every single item in a room. Uh, don't just scan shelves and scan closets, but to physically touch every single item. Uh, every item can go into one of three piles, um, a pile of things that are going to stay in the room, a pile of things that are going to be relocated to a different place in the home. And then the third pile are items that are going to be removed, whether it's recycled or donated, Uh, or thrown away. And the goal, I think, is the more things you can put in that third item, um, the the more freedom you find afterwards. I think it begins with values. At least what I hear you saying is is creating those three piles has to begin with values. Like, do I have vision for the item that's in my hand? Funny story. I, real life story, actually. So last weekend, I just got in this mood and I was like, let's go. It's it's time to declutter. And I live in a small space and I like it that way. I ended up filling five bags of crap that went straight to the dumpster because I said, if I have not worn it in a year or touched it in a year, 
it's gone. So there are a lot of people hanging out with us today that are saying, yeah, but that's got so many memories to it. What do I do with that, Joshua? Um, well, generally, I encourage people not not to start with, with some of the hard things, um, some of the, the sentimental objects and some of the sentimental items. Um, to, uh, to get to those a little bit later once you have experienced what it's like owning less. And then you'll think, okay, how am I going to apply? This is great. How do I apply these principles here? Uh, mm-hmm. Less is different than none. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that I would never say that everyone should get rid of anything. You know, everyone should get rid of everything that has sentimental value or memories attached to it. But adopting a only the best mentality uh, seems to be the best approach. You know, what What makes a museum great isn't that every piece of artwork ever created hangs on the walls, but, uh, but what makes a museum great is that you know, the, the most representative pieces of a artist or a, a um, stage of art, um, a advancement in art, whatever it might be, that, that those are the things that remain. And because fewer pieces are kept, it brings greater value to the ones that do remain, if that mm. makes sense. Mm-hmm. My, mm-hmm. Uh, my wife's grandmother died, and she had like two cardboard boxes full of things that she collected uh, from her grandmother's apartment. They were really close. And when we started minimizing, we got to those cardboard boxes and realized that they had just sat unopened in our basement for like three years. And um, we're like, well, what good is this doing if it's, you know, just you know, boxed up and collecting dust in the basement. And so she went through the box and she grabbed just three pieces that like three items, a, a candy dish that's now in our living room, um, a, a pin that her grandmother used to wear in her coat and her grandmother's Bible, which put in her nightstand. And because we kept fewer of those items, it's almost like we brought more value to that relationship mm-hmm. um, than, than keeping things, you know, um, boxed up in the basement. Yeah, that's really good. Unpack the convenience fallacy, because I think this plays right into the conversation regarding things like the living room, leaving things out because we think they're easier to locate and use, and it just ends up piling up. What do we do about that? Yeah, the convenience fallacy is um, uh, this this argument that I make that uh, that our, our physical possessions are far more of a distraction to us than we realize. Uh, that every physical possession around us calls for our attention, even if it's just briefly, you know, I mean, just scan the room that you're in or the car that you're listening in, like all these things around you, uh, just briefly for a split second, call call for your attention. Um, and what happens is we think that, like the toaster, for example, like we think that it's more convenient to leave our toaster on the counter all day. But in reality, like we just use the toaster for three minutes and then for 23 hours and 57 minutes, <laughs> it's out on our counter and it's uh, a form of visual distraction. It has to be moved every time we want to dust behind it. Uh, and in reality, it's um, far less convenient to leave those things out Um You know, someone might say, well, if I just have one toaster out on my kitchen counter, what's the problem? And maybe if it's just one toaster, that'd be the problem. It wouldn't be an issue. But, you know, there's um, canisters and there's coffee makers and blenders and there's the junk mail that we haven't Mm -hmm. sorted through yet. And and soon our counters just become this this cluttery spot that um, then reality create far more stress, uh, creates far more stress in our day than uh, we alleviate it by leaving all those things out all the time. I literally just did that this past week. I, as I had mentioned, clutter just, it makes me nervous, right? And so I repacked two appliances that were on my kitchen countertop. I haven't used them. I've used them twice in the last year. I'm like, nope, these are going to the box. All of a sudden, when I'm in my kitchen, I'm like, man, I've got better workspace. I feel uh, more clarity in terms of what I'm actually going to do in the kitchen. And I think the kitchen is where I want to stay for a moment, Joshua, because the kitchen is where a ton of action happens. As I had mentioned when I was younger, you know, we all hung out in the kitchen, but the kitchen is a workspace too. So, so what does uh, decluttering and becoming minimalistic in the kitchen look like maybe step by step how do we determine what stays what goes because the kitchen is really fluid with stuff 
Yeah, I would. Um, I would first and foremost, uh, again, just just be clear on you know what what do I want my my kitchen to be? You know, I, I think that your experience is probably an experience that most of us want our our kitchen to be. Um, it's seems to be like the 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 headquarters of the home. You know, it's usually kind of centrally located and. Uh, people are coming and going. It's a uh, a place that we spend time in cooking, and hopefully, uh, my kids do most of their homework in the kitchen while we're cooking and preparing meals. And I, you know, I hope that they walk away with um, incredibly sweet memories of you know spending time in our kitchen, just like um, just like you're explaining. And so I would I would think to my I would start there, and I would say I want this to be a place where. My, my kids have space to do the homework at the counter where I have room to cook and enjoy myself and not get flustered and frustrated by doing it. Um, so um, the, the kitchen tends to be a place where a lot of items collect that don't belong there. Um, right, the the mail on the counter, uh, my wife's purse always seems to go on one of the corners of the counter, uh, backpacks. A hammer in the junk drawer, right? All these things that first and foremost should live somewhere else and should have a different home somewhere uh, in the home. So I begin by by relocating those things. Um, I uh, the the kitchen, you know, we we got um, there's some people I was reading about minimalist, you know, becoming minimalist, and they they have like two two forks and two plates and two cups and stuff. And I'm like, well, I have a family of four, so I need. Like I need more than than two cups and two plates, but as I was mentioning, having people over for dinner, how about eight plates? Like we ended up keeping eight plates and eight cups and eight glasses. Mm. But when we started, we'd have like three sets of eight plates and eight cups and uh, and more coffee mugs than anyone could possibly count, and who knows how many spatulas in our drawer, and all these duplicate items um, that that could be removed and and could free up space and would leave just our our favorites in in all these areas. Um, So I think that's a helpful place to start. Uh, I think as you begin removing some of these things that you don't need, you you start to find homes for like your appliances um, on the counter. You're like, well, suddenly I have room in this cabinet where it's not so hard for me to to put this thing away every single day. I, you know, I would challenge a lot of the assumptions about some of the kitchen gadgets and some of the kitchen tools. Um, I, I was actually really nervous going into the kitchen because of all the tools that we use in there. And I included an article um, by Mark Bittman in the New York Times who found a list of like 35 items. Like if you own these 35 items, you can cook anything that's being prepared in the most professional kitchen in the world today. And um, I use that as kind of my my guide and my starting point. And like, you know what? A lot of things can be done with a knife and a spoon <laughs> as opposed to all these, you know, single gadget things that we think we need to accomplish things in the kitchen. Our, our grandmothers cook far better with far less tools than we have today. You know, it's so true because I, I would consider myself a semi-professional in the kitchen. And I have two really good knives. I have a solid cutting board. And I have three pan slash pots that I rotate and use, and I get everything done. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. Joshua, what's your opinion about having a television in the bedroom? Uh, honestly, it was, um, I think I, I when I, uh, we, we got rid of the, the television in our bedroom. The, the average American home has more televisions than people. So let's just, <laughs> let's just start with that fun fact. Yeah. Uh. When uh, when we started, we had four TVs: uh, living room, kitchen, bedroom, and then one in the basement. And um, and we at one point just we went we just experimented. Literally, it was just let's experiment with having just one TV. And so we took three of them and we uh, we put them in the basement and we left just the one in the living room. And I found that I loved having one television in my house more than having four TVs. Uh, it like there's a small adjustment period, but for the most part, I'm like, wow, look at this. Every time we watch television, we do it together. 
like we compromise about what we're going to watch and when we're going to watch it. Like it, it brought our family closer together rather than everyone just retreating to the rooms in their home to watch whatever it was that they wanted to watch. And I'm like, this is good for us. Like this is good for our family. But getting the TV out of the bedroom was uh, like life changing, like legitimately mm. life changing. Uh, how much time did I waste at night just mindlessly surfing through channels? Um, how many times in the morning would I wake up and just turn on the TV and like allow whatever was on television to become my first thought of the day rather than like taking command of, of my own thoughts in my own mind and, and what am I going to focus on? Um, it was a really a, a distraction from rest and mm-hmm. it was a distraction from intimacy, which uh, for me, those like that was the, the two purposes of our bedroom, you know, for rest and intimacy. And right. uh, the TV wasn't wasn't fostering either of them, but was uh, keeping the room from from doing those things. Well, that's so good. Uh, Joshua, tie minimalism to the concept of unburdening yourself from the past. I mean, that's a really powerful, but could be really painful for some people. It is a, um, it, it is a, a, minimizing your possessions is a difficult process, um, for a lot of people. And it, it brings up a, a lot of emotional turmoil for, for any number of different reasons. And it, um, it causes some people to stop doing it. Um, but I think when that turmoil Um, And when that questioning starts to surface, like this is when we're really starting to learn the most about ourselves and uh, the most value is being brought to us. I, I took like four van loads of things to donate and I'm like, why do I have four van loads of stuff in my home that I don't need? What, Mm -hmm. what was the motivation to buy stuff that I didn't need? And why was this hard for me to get rid of? Or why did I collect this? Um, and I, I didn't always like what I, what I found, um, you know, motivated by jealousy and greed and trying to impress other people or trying to keep up with other people. Like, uh, you know, some of those motivations were pretty unhealthy, um, that surfaced along the way. Wow. Um, you know, one of the, one of the things that, that I, pops up a lot for people is, Um, You know, we keep a lot of items from our our past, uh, whether they represented like a previous season of life that we loved, whether they represent a previous season of life that was really difficult for us. And sometimes we we carry that previous season into our our present season. Um, I just did a radio interview earlier today and a lady called in whose husband had passed away um, eight years ago. Mm -hmm. And... um, She's like, I'm just now starting to go through his things and it's, you know, it's really difficult and do you have any advice for me? And I, like I responded by saying, I, you know, if, if you were to pass away, do you, do you want your husband to, to feel burdened by, by all the things that you had owned? Like, like, no, right? Like you would want your husband to go live their best life today in, in their present season of life. And sure, keep some, like for my kids, like sure, keep some things that remind you of me, but I don't want you to feel obligated to carry my possessions into your next season of life. Um, I want you to uh, to honor the past and, and honor your previous relationships by, by walking fully um, in the, the season of life that you're experiencing today. I think that's how we... Um, yeah honor the past the most and how we how we unburden ourselves a little bit from it whether it was good or bad we uh we learn what we can and we say i'm you know i'm going forward in life and um if if this doesn't serve me going forward in some way or another then um i shouldn't be carrying it with me into tomorrow that's really good Uh, joshua as we're uh, wrapping up here today i'd love to talk about maintaining minimalism what keeps us from regressing into old habits so we we, we jump into the living room, we get it all clean and tidy, and all of a sudden, old habits come back, and we're back to square one. Um, yeah, it's, it, it is a, uh, it's a mindset um, shift and, and change. Uh, it's one thing to uh, declutter. It's one thing to overcome consumerism in your life. There's, 
There's shelves and shelves of books at the bookstore about how to declutter your home, and there are very few about how to overcome consumerism. So it is a uh, it is a different mindset. Um, but I, I think that when we when we own less, uh, when we minimize, when we um, are specific about why we're doing it, and we notice what it is giving back to us as I own less, um, as we see minimalism not. Um, when we focus minimalism not on what I'm getting rid of, but what is coming back into my life because I'm owning less, mm. uh, that that helps us maintain that that lifestyle um, a little bit more. Um, certainly, embracing habits, you know, whether it's daily or weekly or monthly, of of realizing, hey, things are still going to enter into my home. Uh, what are my habits for processing them and getting rid of them? But honestly, the the biggest thing is this. That when we understand that we were created um, for greater things than pursuing and accumulating material possessions, when we realize that our money and our time and our energy can be spent on things that are far more valuable and far more important, uh, we're less inclined than in the future to waste our time and money and energy on things that don't matter Uh, and focus more on the things that actually do. Sure. The best next steps following this conversation are what? I would, uh, I, I would, I would challenge everyone to, to go declutter one space, um, one space in your home, uh, go find the easiest room, uh, maybe it's your car and, uh, and, and just take the time to take out everything that, that doesn't need to be there. Uh, notice notice how it makes you feel um, the next time you're in that space. And maybe I'd add one more. I would encourage people, I always encourage people to research local charities in their community. Um, to spend a little, you know, spend an afternoon, um, an hour, a half hour, just looking up local charities in your area. You, you might be surprised to find out you know, how many mothers um, are living in poverty in your area that could use all those baby toys and clothes that are collecting in your basement or the uh, how many refugee families are getting resettled in your area that would that could put your extra set of dishes to use tomorrow and, and are looking need some of those housewares as they're uh, resetting their life. Um, you know, the, the battered women's shelter that could use some of those clothes that are collecting dust in your closet. I think as you notice some of those needs um, and how your excess things can be used legitimately today by someone. Uh, we're, uh, we're more inclined and motivated to, to look for more things that we can get rid of to help other people with as well. So good. Joshua, how can we connect with you? Uh, I, becomingminimalist.com. That's the, uh, that's the website. Um, as I mentioned, books and stuff, but, uh, but you can find anything and everything from, from there. That seems to be the, the headquarters for everything I do. Thanks for letting me mention that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Joshua, thanks for being here today. I, I really enjoyed the conversation. Great. I appreciate it. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Joshua Becker from Becoming Minimalist. I want you to go grab a copy of his book, The Minimalist Home. Right now, I have links to purchase over at wintoday.tv. Also, be sure to connect with Joshua on Instagram. You can find him at Joshua underscore Becker. And of course, his website is becomingminimalist.com. And hey, if today's conversation resonated with you and you know it'd help a friend, I want you to text five people right now and share the link to this episode, whether on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google, and encourage them to listen and get started on their own journey to minimalism. Well, next week here on the show, I'm joined by the one, by the only, Michael Hyatt. I cannot wait to share this conversation with you. And Michael's joining me to talk about how to unlock the freedom to focus on that which matters most in your life. Here's a preview of my conversation with Michael Hyatt. Yeah, it's it's really hard for most of us to say no, right? I mean, I'm a recovering people pleaser. Yes. And uh, a lot of us suffer from FOMO, the fear of missing out, right? So we don't want to miss an opportunity. Uh, we don't want to miss uh, the, the opportunity to, to meet somebody new or a business opportunity or whatever. So it's, it's, it's hard to say no, but there's also a couple of other diseases. I call these uh, sort of the ugly triplets, but there's FOMO. There's also FODO, F-O-D-O, mm. the fear of disappointing others. Yeah. And I hate the thought of disappointing others. You know, if I, if I say no to a request, I'm going to disappoint that other person and 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 that won't be good and then the the third one of these ugly three is foco f-o-c-o the fear of conflict with others you know if i say no to that person 
It's going to generate some conflict. Maybe they'll challenge me on it. I'll have to defend myself. And so it's just easier to say yes, except that you don't scale. You have 168 hours a week, and there's going to come a point where if you keep saying yes, you will absolutely, utterly destroy your life. That's next week right here on Win Today. Don't miss my conversation with Michael Hyatt. Hey, many of you are brand new listeners of Win Today. And for that, I just want to say thank you. So if you haven't done so already, be sure to hit that subscribe button right now on whichever podcast host you're tuning into. And each and every week, a fresh episode of the show will arrive to you automatically. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, will you take 30 seconds right now to rate and write a review of the show? Doing so helps grow the listenership of Win Today, and that would mean so much to me. Well, hey, until next week, visit me over at wintoday.tv for blog posts and archive podcasts, all aimed at helping you design your roadmap to wholeness from the inside out. Have a great week. We'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.